I'm Lisa Spanierman. I am a professor of counseling psychology and an associate dean for academic personnel and faculty success at Arizona State University. Thinking of myself as a white researcher, and am I always staying aware of my privilege? No, no, I revert back and I forget sometimes. White people are socialized into a colorblind racial ideology to deny, distort, and minimize race and racism. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to this episode of Researching Diversity podcast. I am Zeynep Demir, a PhD student at Bielefeld University in Germany. Today, Jana and I are hosting Lisa Speniermann, who is a professor of counseling and counseling psychology and associate dean for academic personal and faculty success in the College of Integrative Sciences and Arts at the Arizona State University. We talked to Lisa about how she became interested in the topic of racism and whiteness. She mentioned her eye-opening moments in her academic journey. Besides these topics, we also talked about microaggressions and also about the paper by Professor Janet Helms, named I also said white racial identity influences white researchers. Lisa mentioned that when white researchers study racial issues and racism, they must study other white people and they must be highly aware of their own positionality, their own racial identity development. White have to be aware of how racism operates in a white supremacist society and how they are privileged in such a system. I really enjoyed our talk. I hope you do too. So let's start with this episode. Welcome, Lisa, at the Bielefeld University. We are really happy to have you here. You had a really long journey from the Arizona State University to Germany for your research. As in every episode, we will start talking about the past. First, I would like to know, why did you become interested in the topics of white racial identity, allyship and microaggression? I'm just really glad to see the questions in advance to think about this because Now I'm in my 50s, and so really thinking back to where did this inspiration come from, and I was thinking there were a couple of different pathways. One was in my personal life. So I grew up in New York and New Jersey, and interestingly, in New Jersey, it was a very white suburban area, and I mostly, we call it like a white bubble in the research area. And when I went to college, I went to University of Florida, and neither one of my parents had gone to college. I'm first generation. So we weren't on time deciding which school to go to, where to live. We didn't pay ahead of time for the dorm. So interestingly, because I was late, I got placed in the black dorm at Florida. And it's very hot in Gainesville, Florida. It could be 100 degrees with 100% humidity. Fahrenheit, of course. And um, there's no air conditioning in the black dorm. And that's where I lived. And I just, you know, I developed a lot of friendships with black folks. This is in the mid 80s. And I noticed how some white people were not very nice to me when I was with my black friends. And then they were even meaner to black people. So for the first time, I think I had an eye opening moment about how people relate to each other and how race and racism plays a role in that. But I didn't have the academic language yet to make sense of this. Then after I graduated, I kind of went back to my white bubble for a few years. And I waitressed, and I may mention that later. And I worked in these white areas. And then after five years of just working and making a living, I went to Columbia University to Teachers College in New York City, very diverse, very diverse institution, very diverse city, of course. And I was really fortunate to study with some amazing people, including Professor Robert Carter, who was the first Black professor that I had had in graduate school in any training. This was in 1995, and I took a couple of classes with him, and he was inspirational and challenging me to, first of all, I studied harder than I studied ever to learn the material because everything was new. But he also really challenged me to 
understand structural racism in the society, which was a whole new concept for me in college. When I had these friendships, I was focused on this interpersonal kind of racism and more individual level. And then also for the first time to think about white privilege and my privilege and my positionality as a white person, which I had never thought of before. Wow, this is really interesting. Thank you for sharing with us your reflections of your personal and academic journey. After this stations of reflection, I say it here, stations of reflection um, with the university dorms and city influences, um, it seems that these stations led to you become a researcher. I would like to know um, why did you become a researcher? I mean, why you are addressing these issues in science? Well, around that time, 95 to 97, when I was a master's student, like many students, if you were to ask me then, what is going to be your career trajectory? I would say I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do teaching, I'm going to see clients and do therapy, and I'm going to do research. And I realized later, that's very, very hard to do. I, I know some people who do it all, but it's very, very challenging to do all three. And I think I became so passionate about some of the topics that I was learning about in Dr. Carter's classes. And we read Uh, an edited collection called The Impacts of Racism on White Americans. And it was by um, Benjamin Bowser and Hunt. And it, to me, was just so inspiring. And I thought, I really want to research this. And at the same time, there were pretty large classes. I don't know what the classes sizes are like in Europe, but in teacher's college, you could have 80 or 90 students in a seminar in a big class. And I remember when Dr. Carter was teaching certain concepts and constructs, I just remember this one white male student standing up and just saying, I can't take this shit, and just walking out of the class. And I thought, this is so interesting. I really want to study this. So that's kind of the seed. And then when I applied to doctoral programs, I specifically was looking for programs that had a strong focus in multicultural psychology. And I was really fortunate to have amazing mentors at the University of Missouri. And first, Punky and Mary Hepner. And they're just fabulous, supportive, really helped me to develop a sense of self-efficacy as a researcher and a scientist. And then really, when they started to see my strong interest in racism, kind of moved me along and connected me with Professor Helen Neville who instantly, when I started working with her, I thought, I totally, I'm going, I want to research what she researches. I want to do what she does, which I've never quite realized because she's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And I'll never quite hit the level, but every day inspired by that work. And that's when I really started to do empirical research and science. Thanks for sharing with us also the challenges, the barriers with the white male students standing and shouting. I can imagine that this was a really big challenge for the teaching situation at that time. I am pretty sure that you also as a woman maybe had some challenges. And I would like to ask you, which challenges did you encounter on the way to becoming a researcher? That's a really good question. I, I think when I was reflecting on this, I started empirical research late. So in my undergraduate in psychology, I worked in labs. I worked with Dr. Marty Haysacker at University of Florida, but I did more of the background work and ran experiments for some of his doctoral students. And I really didn't get involved in empirical work there. I did some literature reviews. In my master's program, I assisted some folks, but I really, again, didn't take a lead on any kind of a project. And then I didn't have to do a master's thesis at Teachers College or at Missouri. So it really wasn't until my dissertation that I engaged in my first empirical research project. And I see that it was a real challenge for me then going on an academic career because I learned so late how to do science. And so if I could do it over, I um, would try even as an undergraduate to do some kind of a senior thesis, we call this in the States, where I could run some kind of a project. 
Thanks, Lisa, for giving us these insights in your scientific work with all the challenges and perspectives. I would like to continue with my next question based on the challenge question. What did you learn along the way? What Lisa Spenjaman learned along the journey of this academic journey? What didn't I learn? I mean, it's just so much to learn. I, I really love the field of counseling psychology. I find that the people with whom I interacted throughout my years as a student and then continuing on to every level as, a, as an assistant professor, an associate professor, a professor, there's so much support. And there's also a good deal of challenge. So people, I felt like, pushed me to be my best self as a person and also as a professional, so as a scientist and a researcher, but also in terms of as a white person and acknowledging my whiteness and acknowledging my positionality and my privilege. Um, but at the same time, I felt that I had outstanding support to be successful in doing that. Thanks, Lisa. This was really interesting for me. I would like to ask my next question. We had our workshop at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research about racial and ethnic microaggressions. Then we had also an interesting input, an enriching input by your previous PhD student, Zara Hushman, about strategic responses to racial microaggressions. So you also supervise um, diverse PhD students. And I would like to ask you, what advices would you like to give to other junior researchers? And here, especially junior researchers of color um, who are maybe, um, yeah, who belong to ethnic or um, religious minority groups in academic settings. We know, for example, in Germany, academic settings are dominantly white. So I would like to ask you, what advice would you give to doctoral researchers of color For example, like me, have you got some suggestions, some advices, and so on? That's a hard question. I kind of wish I had some of my students with me to answer it to see what was actually helpful for them and what wasn't. But I, I think just kind of reflecting, when my students were most successful, they had a community together. And they supported each other and they worked together. And I supported them however I could. But I think what they got from each other was really, really critical. So you mentioned Sara Hushman. She was my first student at McGill. So I had already been at the University of Illinois for eight or nine years. And then I was at McGill University. And so Sara really helped me to coordinate my lab and bring in the next set of students. And really, I would say that we co-mentored them together in a way. And then we kind of mentored each other. And I think I learned from them as much as they learned from me. But what I appreciated was that we shared a common passion for racial justice. And we kept our work very focused on raising racial consciousness and enhancing justice at McGill University. And that was our focus. And all of us were invested in this together. And I think our lab meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings... Everything was toward that goal and then offering each other whatever kind of personal and professional support along the way. I think being mentored by Mary Hepner and Helen Neville, they use a model that they used to call something like mentoring the whole person. So it wasn't just about my school or my science. They knew me as a person. They knew my struggles, both in terms of different professional kinds of struggles, but personally. And they knew my family. They knew all kinds of things. And so I really tried to implement that model with my students. It wasn't always so easy. Sometimes I didn't meet families until graduation, but I had heard about them and I knew a lot about them. And it was so wonderful and rewarding to finally meet their parents or their siblings or their grandparents at a graduation. But I think, you know, when I was trying to reflect on what's most helpful for students generally, part of it is finding a topic you're passionate about, because I think that's what's going to keep you going. And sometimes students and beginning faculty get pressured to do something that's maybe a little more palatable to white folks, at least this is in the States. And I don't think they should. I think they should work with their advisor 
to find a way to generate a feasible research project around a topic that they're truly passionate about, and then get as many resources as they can to do that. And Punky and Mary Hepner wrote a book And they wrote this while I was still a student and I was a teaching assistant and I used the book in my class as they were writing it. And I was getting feedback from doctoral students to give them. And it was about how to write theses and dissertations. And it's not just the technical training. It's also about your own kind of personal and emotional blocks. And so I found it really valuable for myself writing a dissertation. And then I make sure every student that I work with has a copy of this so that they can see they're not alone when they feel blocked in writing and feel self-doubt and these kinds of things. That's normal. I mean, everybody feels something like that. And I think especially white women and people of color, because we're kind of told we're not as good. So I think having the resources and then also knowing who and when to ask for help but never going at it alone. I think it's just too overwhelming. So getting the kind of support that you need. Thank you, Lisa. I really like the idea of mentoring the whole person. In academic settings, in scientific settings, I think it's also important to see the whole personality with all the pieces and with all the facets and to mentoring the whole person as an idea or as a concept that I can take with me to my academic journey. And also the keyword of resources. And I think you cannot have enough resources, especially if you come from maybe not privileged background, then resources is a keyword. So we are at the end of our past part of this episode. For ending this past part, I would like to end this part with a final question. Can you share with us something good or something positive that happened to you this week? Well, thanks for me getting a chance to come back to Bielefeld. It's just a very exciting opportunity. I didn't do a lot of international travel in my life. When I first got invited to come to Bielefeld, in 2017, I didn't even know if it was a joke, the email that I got. Somebody invited me. I didn't know them. And my younger sister does a lot more international travel. I sent it to her and I said, do you think this is real? And she said, yes, go. So I pursued it. And then I came and I was part of a research group here, an interdisciplinary research group. And I lived here for seven months. And it was just such a wonderful experience for me I think especially as a Jewish person to be in Germany. And my grandfather, my paternal grandfather is from Austria, and he moved to the States in 1912. And I can see his name on the ship manifest for Ellis Island and all of this. And our last name was spelled with two N's, Spanier Mann. So it was just interesting. And then to be here and then to be among all of these amazing scholars and then to meet Andrea Sick and have all of these opportunities So to be able to come back three years later after COVID and see some friends and colleagues, that's just been such a a gift to spend time with you again. And then having this conference on international and interdisciplinary approaches to racial and ethnic microaggressions and being a part of that group has been very rewarding for the last two and a half years. And then to come together in person was just incredible. Thank you, Lisa, for giving us a really enriching insight to your academic and personal journey. I really liked the past part of this episode. I would like to continue here with the present part. The present part is about discussing a cutting-edge article in the field. For this section, we ask you to select one research article on the topic of this episode that you believe to be cutting-edge, which has recently inspired you or which has influenced you personally and professionally. So I would like to know, which paper did you bring today? Well, I brought a paper that really inspired me over the years from 1993, and it was written by Professor Janet Helms. And the title is, I also said, white racial identity influences white 
researchers. Thanks a lot, Lisa. This is a really interesting research article. I had the chance and the opportunity to read this article before in advance. But before continuing with the next questions, I would like to ask you, because it's a really complex and deep topic, if you had to explain this paper to your grandma or to your cat or something which is not familiar with science or where you would like to practice this paper in presenting, for example, non-scientific audience, how would you do this? It's really a, it's such an interesting question because I reflected and I realized I never explained these concepts to my family. I just pieces because it is it's very complex and it's so different than the way white folks think on a daily basis who are outside of academia. So, but partly why I picked it too, is I had earlier mentioned how Professor Robert Carter was influential in my training. He was a student of Professor Helms. So there was this lineage here. And when I first became an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, I put together a symposium and I invited Professor Helms to be the discussant. And when I told her that I had learned about her work through Dr. Carter, she says, okay, anyone who's connected to Robert Carter, I'm going to show up. And she showed up at my symposium, which was on whiteness, and it must have been in 2002. And when she opened her comments as the discussant, Dr. Helms said, well, I'm going to start and say I'm the mother of whiteness. And she's an African-American. She's a Black woman. So it was quite funny in a way because we were all white researchers. And it is true that white people learned about whiteness, not from necessarily white people, but from people of color, from Black scholars, from Indigenous scholars, from Latinx scholars. This is how we learn about ourselves. And part of white privilege is that we didn't have to really look at ourselves for so many years in our field. And so if I were going to explain this to my grandmother or family member, I think I would talk about what struck me in this article is that white people have to acknowledge their position, our position in society, that we are at the top of a racial hierarchy or racialized social system, as Eduardo Bonilla Silva, sociologist, says, and what that means to be at the top in a white supremacist society, that all kinds of unearned privileges come along with that so that we grow up thinking that all of our achievements are based on our hard work and merits, but they're not. And that that's very hard to take in at first. And that in this particular article, it's a short piece, it's a reaction, she's telling white researchers in our field that even you who are doing this work, and at the time it was called in cross-cultural psychology, but now it would be saying doing work on race, racism, ethnic minority psychology, these sorts of things, that the white researchers can do serious damage to communities of color if they're also not aware of their positionality. And I think that's what really struck me about this piece as a white researcher myself, thinking I want to make sure not only that I'm not doing harm, but I'm doing good for students, for communities, for colleagues, these sorts of things. Thanks a lot, Lisa. This is a really outstanding paper. I think this is also maybe um, hard to accept for especially white researchers. And I think before changing something or before doing something, you have to accept it. And I think um, this paper seems to be outstanding on addressing this problem really good and also for the acceptance of this problematic situation. And I would like to know, as a next question, did this paper impact your scientific work? Because I know that you also published a lot of on the issues of microaggression, impact your work on this and also maybe your way of thinking. It affected me in many ways. But the one thing that really where I kind of see a thread is, number one, thinking of myself as a white researcher and Am I always staying aware of my privilege? No, no, I revert back and I forget sometimes why people are socialized into a colorblind racial ideology to deny, distort, and minimize race and racism. And that's Professor Neville's work that I was so inspired by. 
And so it's a constant dance or push to, to remember that and stay out abreast of that and be on top of it. Not only just thinking about myself and being so self-focused, but then really wanting to see the state of the field. And so, okay, this 1993 paper came out of a symposium at APA, at the American Psychological Association Annual Convention in 1990. Then I did my symposium in the early 2000s. And then in around 2015, 2016, I started talking with some colleagues thinking, well, what are white researchers doing today? Are they realizing the message from Janet Helms? Are they um, reflect? And Jen Helms wasn't the only person who wrote these. In the Counseling Psychologist, which is one of the flagship journals for counseling psychology, we have this format called a major contribution. So sometimes it could be a hundred page paper that really articulates or conceptualizes a new theory, something innovative, or it could be a collection of empirical papers. And at the time, Thomas Parham, Daryl Wing Sue, they all were in the symposium and they all responded to this idea about, and the question then was, should white people even do this kind of research? And then we argue in this, we also do a major contribution in 2017 on white racial justice allies. And we don't just focus on white research this many years later. We also look at, should white people be teaching about race and racism and teaching the multicultural psychology courses in their programs? Should white people be doing multicultural psychology in their clinical practice? And what is the state of the field today? So I think this early work from 1990 said it all. And in many ways, some things hadn't changed. And there were still a lot of white people operating from a colorblind racial perspective. And you still have predominantly white folks as the gatekeepers, as the journal editors, as the associate editors, as the full professors, when you look at the statistics and these sorts of things. But at the same time, there were more white people who were demonstrating this critical awareness and the self-reflexivity that Dr. Helms was talking about in the 1990s and maybe demonstrating some of those more sophisticated statuses of white racial identity development. Thank you, Lisa. This is a short paper, but with a really loud reaction. And this in 2022, I mean, this article is from 1993, but still today we have this loud reaction to this short paper, to this issue. And this shows to me that also short papers can have a really good impact or a step forward. And I would like to know, because you know our name of this or our title of this podcast is Researching Diversity. There is a gaming with the word re and search diversity. So I would like to ask you, why is this paper important for the field of diversity? Well, I think that this paper by Dr. Helms and that whole collection back in 1993 really woke up some white people and said, hey, if we're going to do this kind of work, we have to do it with a critical lens. I think that counseling psychology has been out in front in many ways of some of the other subfields of psychology. And I could say this because right now I am serving as a guest editor of a special section in a developmental psychology journal, um, the Journal of Research on Adolescence. And we're looking at confronting whiteness in developmental science. And they're really behind. They're really behind. And so I think some of the researchers in this special section are introducing the white racial identity development theory from Dr. Helms to developmental scientists for the first time. They do tremendous work on ethnic and racial identity development for folks of color, but they haven't thought about how the context of white supremacy has an impact on the development of white youth. So I think her work really brought forth a whole next generation of scholars in counseling psychology that are paying attention to these issues in their work. Thank you, Lisa. Um, you said at the beginning that this article woke up the white researchers. And here is the question for me. I mean, 
was this a waking up from sleep or ignorance? Because if you woke up, if you show your reaction, maybe you was not aware of something or you was ignorant of that. I would like to understand it a bit better. How would you define it, this waking up situation after this article? I think it's all of the above. Asleep. You know, white people, we are socialized not to see race and racism or to locate it in radical right-wing extremists and neo-Nazis so that it's not us. And to not realize how much we benefit from these structural and systemic aspects of racism. So we're asleep, we're ignorant, even when it's introduced to us, we don't want to see it. So there might be some active and some passive resistance to the concept. And, you know, when we wrote our major contribution about white racial justice allies in this current moment, we had some reactants. We had Daryl Wing Sue and Bill Cross, you know, who are just and such an honor to have them react to our work. And I, I did this major contribution with Laura Smith, who's at Teachers College. But they talked a lot about Bill Cross and his colleagues said that even when white people developed like an anti-racist stance in our field or racial justice commitments, that it seemed serendipitous. It wasn't a planned development or training through our programs. And that even our multiculturally savvy programs reproduce the next generation of colorblind racial ideology, especially in white folks. So what does this mean? And we still have a lot more work to do. Thanks, Lisa. So I can understand this situation a bit better. I would like to know you, what are your current research projects or publications? Yeah, I'd love to. And first of all, just full disclosure, when we had the racial and ethnic microaggressions workshop, I opened by saying, what a joy to have the opportunity to be among a group of scientists, because in my administrative role, my administrative role is very tied to my racial justice commitments. But in that role, I'm often pulled away from research. So it's such a joy to be back in the science space. But in addition to working on that special issue with all the authors in developmental science, When Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd, I had a new group of doctoral students coming in and three who hadn't even started the program yet. But we had kind of an emergency Zoom meeting and said, we want to do some research on this. So literally within one week, we developed a survey and we got IRB approval, which is kind of amazing. ASU is very, very fast. You could get it in one week. And we collected data from white people who demonstrated in Black Lives Matter protests after the murder of George Floyd. And so we collected data on their racial attitudes, on their racial emotions or affect, and on their behaviors in terms of, was this their first protest or have they been longtime um, white racial justice allies? We have these data and we've done our preliminary analysis. And I think I might have mentioned to you, we used latent profile analysis to see if there were different kinds of white people who are out there. Because I don't know what it was like in Germany, but in the States, there were just the numbers of white people that came out to march alongside people of color seemed unprecedented. From just looking at some of the data from the Pew Research Center and some of the photographs and what we saw on the news, it seemed that something had happened where white people had had enough and came out in the streets. And some of the polling data also shows how support really increased at that time for Black Lives Matter. Now, unfortunately, just a few months later, it went back down to baseline levels. So we didn't sustain But it was interesting. We wanted to kind of find out what was happening. And we, in our work right now, we identified three profiles and we're getting some pushback from journals because we, our sample size was only 200. And to do latent profile analysis, best practices want a replication sample. And my thought is, well, I hope we don't have to have another black man killed or a black individual killed to replicate it. My students were really awesome on this. Yeon Kim, she's from South Korea. 
she ran the primary analyses, but we really worked as a team with Jessica Burton, Jackson Lagori, Danny Schultz, just doing all this work together. But our three profiles that we found, we found on one end of the spectrum, racial, committed racial justice activists who have been doing activism work for a long time. And this wasn't their first time out in support for Black Lives Matter. They had this longer standing commitment. They had very low levels of colorblind racial ideology. They had high levels of white guilt, which is something that I've researched over the years, and a sense of responsibility to do something. And then they also had these high levels of social justice intentions and anti-racist behaviors. So that we'd expect. Wasn't the biggest group, but that was one group. The smallest group was all the way on the other end, and we were calling these racial justice tourists. And they just kind of showed up because they went with someone. Sometimes it was their mother. Sometimes it was their daughter. Sometimes a friend brought them along. Sometimes they were just curious. So that was a very small group. So only 18 out of 200, if I'm remembering correctly, were in the tourists. The largest group, which I think maybe explains this giant surge of white people coming out, were calling emergent racial justice activists. Mm -hmm. And this could be their first protest or maybe their second. And then they went to multiple protests around this time. And we think it has to do with this confluence of factors at that moment. So seeing this horrific murder over nine minutes on the television and having that video from the teenage girl, I all of a sudden I can't think of her name, who really took the shocking video while she was there. And I believe she won a Pulitzer Prize or something for the video. And at the same time, having this global pandemic and having time maybe away from work or home and just frustration. And then also coming off these four years of Donald Trump and all of his blatant racist rhetoric that was in our homes through, you know, mainstream media on the news all the time. So I, I'm not the first to kind of put all of these together. Some journalists put these together, but maybe that's what brought out all these emergent folks. And then I really liked what you said before about the tourists. I'm really interested in this about these emergent folks. Which of these people then stay on with their commitments? And why did so many revert to baseline levels and go back? And what can we do as scholars and practitioners to capture the moment and help white people to maintain these commitments? I think it's really interesting because I could immediately picture people for all of these three categories and people not only in my personal life, but also colleagues, I think, who have seen this as an opportunity to really reflect more on their own activism, I guess, um, that is related to their work. So I find that really interesting, or really nice, uh, a nice way of summarizing these different types of people. I had one more question, if I may. So going all the way back to the article, because it's, uh, yeah, we would really like to use it for our teaching. What I really liked about the article by Janet Helms is that she gives a very clear, like six stages of white identity And for me, a very clear description of what that means. And it, for me, it really helped to see going all the way from, well, the first stage she mentions is contact. So that means, for example, gathering data that also includes some people of color, but predominantly is about white samples and just completely negating that there are people in the sample that are not part of this white majority. Going from this all the way to the sixth step, which she calls autonomy, which is really about recognizing cultural assumptions that I might have as a researcher and not to impose my own assumptions onto non-group members, so people who are not part of the same group. And all the fine, yeah, the grays in between, all these steps in between, she lays out really nicely in this work. And I was now wondering, because these are nice examples, but which of these stages do you mostly encounter when you talk to other researchers, maybe at conferences or in your daily practice? Is there one of these stages where you think that's where we mostly are situated, like more on the contact end of the spectrum or more on the autonomy end of the spectrum? 
I think it depends. I think that's a really good observation. And just an aside, one of the things I want to say is she's published a lot on this model. This is just one little piece with an application to researchers. There's a book from 1990. There's a revision of the model in 1995. But there's this fabulous book that I actually used to buy and give to my students that there's a revised edition that's come out now that's called Race is a Nice Thing to Have. And it's pretty much a guide for white people and like white people, you know, you know and love kind of thing. But it really fleshes out and has exercises and things. So it's been a while since I looked at it and I haven't seen the latest edition, but I used to give earlier editions to my students. In this, with the application to researchers, I think it depends where I am. So, you know, when I'm working with people who aren't focused on race and racism, I often see contact. You see this in other, you know, I don't know if either of you have had the pleasure of reviewing manuscripts for a journal or being a co-reviewer. But when you review a manuscript, many of our journals, once the action editor makes a decision, whether it's a revise and resubmit or rejection, they send back the decision letter to the author and all the reviewers get copied and get to see all the reviews. So sometimes you see reviews And there's no attention to race or racism. And so there's contact. I would say among the people who I work with, the white people, where we get stuck in the field a lot of times is in pseudo-independence because it's an intellectual understanding of race and racism. And I think it's a little bit different than having that kind of personal connection. And I remember when I was in Robert Carter's classes in the mid-90s, I remember getting maybe a D or some terrible score. So in the States, it's A, B, C, D, and then fail. And I got a D on something. I don't think I'd ever got a D. And it was because I was intellectualizing. And he said, you're doing a great job articulating the concepts, but I'm not seeing them integrated into who you are and how you're thinking and how you're feeling about this and how you are living in the world. And I remember thinking, whoa, this is really hard and and a huge challenge. And I went and met with him and talked about it. And I think it was really helpful to, we have this thing called Race Lab. It's kind of infamous and he's written about it where we, and once I went through Race Lab, I had opportunities to feel things around this with my colleagues. And it was a very, very challenging academic experience. Uh, because I like to be in my head. I felt some control there. So I think that's kind of where I see a lot of white people stuck in the field. But of course, I've been very fortunate to have interactions with my colleague, Laura Smith, or to attend presentations by Michelle Fine, you know, these amazing white women who really embody the autonomy status and who really get it in a way that's very, very meaningful. And you mentioned specifically pseudo-independence. And there I think it's interesting, so maybe to describe for our students, to explain it a little, that means that even when you do research and you find differences between different cultural groups or disadvantaged groups compared to the majority or white groups in your research, then it stops at the place where you try to explain things you find for the minorities or for the disadvantaged groups, but you might not make the extra steps to explain the findings for the majority or for the white um, participants, for example. So this would be a good example for our students to identify this pseudo-independence state. This brings us to the next section, the future. What changes would you like to see in the upcoming years regarding research on your topic? First of all, I was really fortunate when I was an assistant professor to have an expert on mixed methods in my department, Jennifer Green. And I think mixed methods is just phenomenal in terms of answering questions to be able to use multiple methods to look at research questions from different angles and then to bring it together in a systematic way. I think it's super helpful, but we don't have a lot of training in mixed methods. We have quantitative, which I think 
is still paramount. And then we have qualitative in psychology, right? In counseling psychology, they're becoming more open to qualitative methods, but I don't yet see a lot of this kind of mixed methods work and really, I think, also understanding more on the philosophy of science undergirding these methodological approaches. So I think that's one piece that's really, really important for the future. And the other thing, having had the experience of teaching in Canada, in addition to the United States, I felt like my students in Canada had much greater opportunities to focus on research and science. They had major grant support from the government, from Social Science and Humanities Research Council, SHRC, gave them you know, maybe even $110,000 that just gets dropped in their bank accounts so that they don't have to worry about having a full-time job while they're doing school. And these, the projects that were being supported were on racial microaggression. And so it showed that the Canadian government was behind and supporting this kind of work that they were doing. And so my students in the States, both at the University of Illinois and at Arizona State University, and I remember this when I was a student, it's hard. I don't know what it's like here, but it's hard on them. They're taking 12, sometimes 15 credits of classes. They're trying to read and keep up. They are doing 20 hours a week of assistantships. So they might teach two classes and they might be the instructor who's responsible for the course. And for those of you who teach, that's a lot of work, the preparation, getting your lecture. And plus, when you're new, you spend 10 times as much time trying to make sure it's perfect, then grading and all of this. Then they're doing their clinical placements. So they're seeing clients out in the field. That could be another 20 hours a week. So it's like 60 hours doing all these things and not even any time for research. And so in Canada, I saw a really different model where there was a lot of financial support for students to train the next generation of scientists in the field. And I really hope that we can find ways to support students and especially students of color in the States so that they can then become the next generation of academicians at the universities training the next generation of academics and clinicians. I think it's really important to stress the need for support on different kinds of levels from uh, faculty to students, but also among faculty, among staff. You've already also said this in the past section. And uh, you have also been publishing, especially about white allyship. And I think that also somehow <laughs> connects with issues of support, because what I found really interesting reading your article is that there's really a need for us to also go from thinking from helping people towards transforming the system. And maybe would you mind explaining this a bit more, what that entails in the whole aspect of white allyship? Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. So in our article that Laura Smith and I published in 2017, that was an introduction to our major contribution. And we talked about the pitfalls and the possibilities of white allyship. And we talk about the same thing in this study after George Floyd's murder. And I also wrote a chapter out of my work when I was in Bielefeld in 2018, 2019, and it's on white guilt, but I really situated it during that summer of Black Lives Matter. And so all of this to say, we can really do it wrong, which is kind of what Dr. Helms was saying back in 1990, that we think we're doing it right, but we're not. And so one of the biggest pitfalls in white allyship is white people were used to being, quote, superior, even if we don't think about it consciously, we're used to being in charge. And so we're used to helping people. And a lot of white people can get a sense of, I don't know, like a feeling good kind of thing from helping people of color. And that, you know, it has been critiqued in cultural studies, in sociology, in all sorts of fields, gender women studies, as being paternalistic, that it further reproduces and separates like a superiority and inferiority position. Some of the scholars in that 1990 response spoke about this kind of false empathy or false charity when white people do this kind of work. 
And what does it mean to really do this work in solidarity? And interestingly, in this study with the white protesters from the summer of 2020, we also collected qualitative data. We interviewed people. So we're just starting to analyze that when I get back to the state. But I'll never forget because I conducted some of the interviews. And this one white woman said, who had been a longtime activist, said what she really learned was, sit down and shut up, white girl. And that really helped her to not think she has to be out in front, but that she has a place that's very important in a supporting role and that she needed to sit down and she needed to listen instead of trying to take over. And I think for those of us who are white academics committed to this project, um, that may be a struggle because we're used to being in charge of things. And then at the same time, when we are in charge of things, like in my role as I was the faculty head for eight years or as associate dean, really using power and privilege in ways that create justice. That's the joy, I think, of being in a leadership role in academia, because the leadership role is hard in academia. Nobody thanks you. Nobody cares. But if you can do it in a way that creates justice, then I think there's just some internal sense of reward. So I try to create the conditions where scientists of color, scholars of color in my unit can do their work and be successful And I try to help take some of the obstacles out of their way, but they don't need my help to be successful. They just need me to kind of block the things that are going to get in their way. So for example, other racist colleagues who may be committing racial microaggressions that take a lot of emotional and cognitive energy from them in the day to day. So wherever I can intervene and stop that as a white person, that's my responsibility. Thank you for also providing such a concrete example, because I can totally relate from my own work of trying to improve the feelings of belonging of actually all of our students in our program. But a lot of times there's funding available or so, which is then very much tailored to, you know, increasing belonging of cultural minority students, of first generation students in higher education And I struggle with the fact of saying, yeah, on the one hand, we need to, of course, tailor interventions or our program. On the other hand, singling out certain groups of students and just assuming that they need our help, you know, comes again from this false empathy or maybe just from an assumption without, you know, going from the actual needs of the students. And we try from different ways, you know, to actually ask them early on uh, what they need or connecting them to mentors. So having a very like low threshold first contact moment and so on. But I find it very difficult to tackle transforming the system, you know, while being, as you said, in all those positions that we have, all the management, all the other tasks that are in academia. So how to best transform the system, I find that very difficult. Do you maybe have also other examples on how you have tackled this in your own work? Because my work focused more on faculty because I have a training director who works directly with the students. But I think working with faculty, it's making sure that faculty of color have the tools that they need to be successful and to get their promotion with tenure, which is a very, very big thing in the States. To make sure that when we're doing searches to hire for new faculty, that we're actively recruiting scholars of color And scholars of color who are committed to a racial justice project. And I think that's been really important. I think training director wise, like right now we have in our program, a black woman is the training director. And I think it's important for students to see black women in positions of power in academe and have somebody who looks like them. You know, there's always more that we can do, but I think we're moving in a good direction. And I feel really good about the person who's coming to take over for me as the head, Dr. Aisha Chiftchi. And she'll be starting in the next week or so. And she is incredible in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she does next in terms of supporting our faculty and our students. And students have been really calling for an intersectional approach to things. They definitely want a strong focus on racial justice, 
but they also want to focus on cisgenderism and other sorts of interlocking forms of oppression and having advocacy out in the community and in the world as part of the work that they're doing. Thank you so much for providing these examples. I have two more questions, but I know we're really pressed for time. But maybe I can I can still ask both and then we'll see if we <laughs> will keep both of them in, if that's okay for you, Lisa. One question is um, specifically because I find that all of your work has such a strong imperative for activism. So it is on one hand the actual empirical research, but then on the other hand taking a bit of a meta view on how we're doing research, how can this be improved. And by constantly having this extra lens, I was wondering if you don't constantly get into very frustrating situations where you're sitting somewhere, people are having a conversation and you're always looking from this meta perspective and thinking, ah, you are stuck in the contact idea or ah, if I only had the time to explain to you all the different stages that are still ahead. <laughs> or, you know, so how do you deal with these, I would call them frustrations, I guess, or having constantly this meta view on how we approach our research, for example? I think that's a really good question. It, it certainly comes up, but not so much in counseling psychology. I think that in my sub-discipline, people know the white racial identity development theory. They understand racial identity development. They understand white privilege for the most part, not everybody. Certainly when I was the vice president for scientific affairs for the Society of Counseling Psychology from 2012 to 2015, and sometimes when I served on the executive board, We didn't all agree, and there I might have some frustration, but I always felt like I could go out for a drink with my colleagues and talk about it, and they were open to learning. And this is usually an older generation of white men, a generation ahead of me. But I always felt support, and I always felt that they listened um, when we talked with them. And then I think in my own milieu at Arizona State University and my unit, everybody gets it. So it doesn't mean we all do everything right and we don't make mistakes. We do. But I think we all work from the same assumptions on wanting to create the conditions where there's greater racial justice in the world, in our community, in our field, and all this. It just may look different to different people. So I don't feel as frustrated there. And I think it's more when I attend university-wide meetings and have people from different disciplines. And I just don't do that that much. So I guess I'm kind of protected in a little enclave. And then even when I come here to do work, it's around racial and ethnic microaggression. So everybody who's involved has some commitment to that project. And so maybe as I've gotten older, I've chosen to surround myself more so, at least in the academic sphere with people who think more like me about these kinds of issues. So I don't have those frustrations. But then again, out in the world, maybe if I'm having a barbecue with some colleagues in another discipline, they may not understand what I'm describing to them. Oh, well, tell me about this workshop on racial and ethnic microaggression. And what does it mean? And I may bump up against some frustration there, but I always get excited about the idea of changing or opening white people's minds the way that I learned. Because I, I, don't, I don't think that I knew this most of my life. It wasn't until I was in my mid-20s and Professor Carter had to teach me and I had to be committed and open to then doing this hard work myself. And I have to really be committed every day. It's not like, oh, I've arrived and all of a sudden I'm in the autonomy stage. No, I move around. I go back to contact sometimes. And it's really good when I have strong relationships with friends and colleagues of color who can help me check myself. And it happens more often. So that's the frustrating part for me is when I catch myself doing something that I maybe feel embarrassed or guilty or ashamed about and then trying to get back on track. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It also helps, I think, for us to hear that there's it's a growing process and <laughs> we might be just yeah on the way, but it's, it's never an ended process. Huh? So um, thank you so much. And one final question I have for you is how do you stay motivated in your job as a researcher, but also in all the other roles that you have? Well, I'm so lucky, I think, with the research that I have close colleagues who I write with and students 
who are excited about the work. And even like in this recent racial and ethnic microaggressions workshop, for those of you who know Andrea Stick, he was, has so much energy and enthusiasm. I, I don't even know if he sleeps, but I could feel, and he was so encouraging of all these scholars in the room that I felt myself getting excited and like wanting to collect data immediately so that we can analyze it and find out some things in Germany to build on my colleague, Monica Williams, a Canada research chair, who's already started to translate some measures into German and collect some data here. So I think for me, because I'm a social person, I think it's the connection with other people that keeps me really excited. And then I have the curiosity that kind of investigative personality that I just want to know things. I want to learn. I'm often in a learning frame. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us today and for helping us increase visibility of outstanding social scientists such as yourself and of cutting edge research. So thank you all for listening and talk soon. We want to thank Minor Revisions for the music, Max Kersten for post-production, Lotte Koeman for logo design and Zeynep Alpay for artwork. Make sure to visit our website for bonus materials and to follow us on social media at Researching Diversity Podcast. Stay tuned and talk soon. Music